What is up, everybody? It's Monday, and all the heavy lifting has been done because it's dark, and you're through with a full work day. And uh, we've got a beautiful show tonight, um, one that I'm really excited about. Uh, the the great Chuck Dowdle, Jake Roos, is joining us. You and know, I you, not you know I'm happy. excited about this. Oh, I'm, dude, you I'm know sorry. I'm excited about this one. I've told this story so many times, man, but like I, when I first kind of got into the business uh, of recruiting, I remember um, that like no one in my family understood what I did and, and didn't understand how it was something that could make money or, or how it was a big deal. But I remember the first time I got asked to do Bulldog Roundtable and I told my granny that I was going to be on the radio with Chuck Dowdle and she couldn't believe it. She thought it was just like the most unbelievable thing that Chuck Dowdle would want to talk to me. Um, and so it was like the first time my family kind of really, I guess, appreciated what I did or, uh, um, you know, kind of got into it. So uh, I, I grew up watching Chuck, man, and I, I'm so excited to have him on. Chuck, Chuck brings, uh, Chuck brings, uh, credibility to you and to maybe bark after dark after today is over with, uh, that's heavy lifting. That's a, hey, it's a lot of weight for one man to bear. I will say that. Um, as listen, let me throw my disclaimer out before we bring Chuck on. Chuck's going to have some Georgia stuff and we're going to talk Georgia stuff with him. But listen, if you're co if you've come to watch this show because you like Georgia, football talk or or you want a bunch of information not the show for you deeply unserious show we goof off we hang out we interview other people in the media and other all other walks of life and and kind of discuss origin stories with that said let's let chuck come on with us man we we uh he is the he is so he is the the analyst for georgia basketball uh former sideline reporter for georgia football he's done countless other things in media and uh on top of it all in my opinion, there's no better dude I've ever hung out with and, and spent well, time with than this guy right here. I got I got to tell you, both of you, uh, when I was asked to be on, uh, as many times as you guys were so kind to give up your time and come on Bulldogs Roundtable, e even for your grandmother, uh, <laughs> it was and your folk that that listen, uh, Jake's my two favorite Jake's. I, uh, there was no way I was going to miss this uh, an opportunity to kind of to pay it back some because uh, you guys were on so many times and helped me out so many times with that Bulldog Crown Table. And we like people that knew what they were talking about, you know, knew what the hell they were saying and, <laughs> and knew the game and, and knew Georgia football. And both of you guys fell high on that ladder. So, uh, so thanks so much for, for your time. Well, you are on the short list of people who would say that about us. I'd say that. <laughs> well, I think, I think only Kirby, you know, only Kirby would rank ahead of me as saying these two guys know too much about what's going on. <laughs> uh, Chuck, um, we kind of start everybody off by uh, getting a little bit of background, man. I, I know, uh, you know, Georgia fans are going to be deeply familiar with your work in the Georgia sphere and certainly your work at WSB, but take us back even before all of that, man. Where does the Chuck Dowdle story start? Um, you know, uh, where do you come from and, and how do you kind of make your way to Georgia? I'm a native. I was born in Atlanta, grew up in Atlanta, went to Briarcliff High School, which is uh, now, I think after I left, it went out of business. Uh, it's closed up. But uh, I attended the University of Georgia for a couple of years and uh, played basketball on the uh, freshman team in 67 and um, with some uh, some great guys. One was Tom Brennan, uh, who went on to be a, a great coach um, and uh, ESPN analyst. But uh, then uh, I transferred to Georgia State, uh, went back home to with the family and transferred to Georgia State and graduated from Georgia State, uh, worked for the Atlanta Braves uh, for a number of years on their ground crew uh, at old Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Uh, when I graduated, um, my first job was in Johnson City, Tennessee, and I was there for about nine months. And lo and behold, uh, a news director from a television station in Miami, Florida, uh, happened to be on vacation in Gatlinburg, saw me on the air, uh, went back, wrote me a letter and said, you know, don't know if you're interested in moving, but if you are, uh, we'd like to talk to you. So I flew down to Miami. I'd never been to Miami and I got hired there. And among the things that, uh, that I started off doing, boy, there's a shot that brings back memories. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, my goodness, that hair is the same. <laughs> uh, look at that. But uh, I, I hosted Don Shula's TV show uh, for about 13 years and did sports in Miami. But I also got to know a, uh, 
a high school kid that was uh, playing football uh, up in, uh, uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Actually, I think he was up in Boca. was a young man named Mark Rick, uh, who was one of the most highly rated quarterbacks uh, in the country. And he decided to stay at home and go to the University of Miami. And he backed up a, a guy that was, uh, according to everybody but Mark's mom, was better than Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Just as Mark was a better quarterback, but that was Jim Kelly. Uh, but Mark did a great job uh, with the University of Miami. And then uh, he had a quick cup of coffee with, uh, I think it was Denver. And then he came to Miami. And when he got cut by those two teams, then he, of course, went to FSU and became an assistant coach there and uh, grew up under Bobby Bowden. And then when he came to the University of Georgia uh, as head coach, we already had a relationship and I started doing his TV show and, uh, you know, just absolutely love the years with Mark and uh, and all that he accomplished and the level that he took uh, Georgia football to. I, I do have one quick story I have to tell about Mark uh, from his first year. Uh, and, and Mark, you know, is a very honest, straightforward guy. And uh, he didn't mind telling you, you know, I've never been a head coach before. I'm kind of not accustomed to this situation. And if you'll recall uh, our third game of the season that year, his first year, we go to Tennessee to play the Volunteers where we had not won. And I think it was like 20 years. It'd been a long time. And, but it was our first road trip and we were one and one. Uh, we'd lost a game at home to South Carolina, but now we were going to Tennessee to play the Vols. And, um, and Mark says, well, why don't you come over to the office on Friday? He says, we'll have lunch and then we'll get on the buses and head to the airport and, and fly to Tennessee. I said, fine. Uh, so I go over and we're sitting around his office chatting and we get ready to go have lunch and we get up, we walk out and he locks his office and we go walking down the hall and about halfway down the hall, he just stops dead and he just drops his shoulders. And I looked around and said, what's the matter? He said, I left the game plan in my office. <laughs> and so he walks back and he goes back in his office. I'm thinking rookie, you know, and he goes back, he gets the game plan and he comes walking out and as he walk, and now I got to give him a hard time. Right. So I said, game plan. We got a plan. This is great. We've got a plan. Now I don't feel so bad about going to Tennessee where we haven't won in forever because we've got a plan. And so I'm giving him a hard time about having a plan. And uh, so we get on the bus and we, we fly to Knoxville. Now, I don't see him again. And you all know how that game went. Um, and the next day, uh, you know, I'm down on the sideline for the last couple of minutes of that game. And here comes David Green moving the team uh, right up the field. And, of course, Veron Haynes, hobnail boot, Georgia wins. And, you know, huge win, particularly for a rookie coach in his first year on the road at Tennessee, a place that the dogs have had very little success in, in a couple of decades. And, and so he goes out, he shakes hands with Phil Fulmer. And as he's walking off the field, I just, you know, I'm happy for him. I've known him since he was in high school. I covered him in high school. I covered him at the University of, of Miami. And I'm happy for him. And I step out and put my hand out to shake his hand. He grabs my hand. He pulls my, reaches up, cups me around the back of the neck, pulls my head down. And in my ear, he goes, we had a plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is incredible. The, the that is absolutely that incredible. At that time, he says we had a plan, and I said, like, "Yep, they had a plan." <laughs> that is that's an amazing story. I'm I'm oh glad that you get got us gave us a chance to to hear yeah. that one because that one was <laughs> I remember that game really well. I was in high school, and and I just I remember thinking several times, "All right, it's just not meant to be. It's just yeah. kind of, you know just a close call." And uh, you know, obviously, they made it happen. So obviously, you know, it's, and you said it straight up, you think the world of coach Rick, can you tell us, obviously he's got, he's got his, um, he's got his reputation and it's hard earned. It's well earned as, as a good man. Is it, is it, is that the Mark Rick, you know, is that the, I mean, is, is that, does that come through in, in personal interaction? A absolutely. Uh, but I also knew the Mark Rick that was at the university <clears throat> of Miami, and he will tell you that that was a different Mark Rick. You know, he, he got suspended uh, from the University of Miami football team and and went through some uh, some tough times <laughs> at the University of Miami because he was a different guy then. He was a totally different guy then. And uh, and, and Mark would tell I, I'll tell you this story. Uh, we had uh, we had been on the road. I, I believe it was at Vanderbilt. 
and uh, we beat Vanderbilt, but it was by a, a very uh, close margin. Uh, and I think that was the game where at, at half, the, the score was five to three. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a really strange game. But we won the football game. And we fly back into Atlanta, and we, we land uh, on the tarmac, and, um, and and we're the players are loading onto the buses to head back to Athens. He and I have to wait for Steve Rushton, our state trooper, to pull the state patrol car around to take us to the TV studio in Atlanta to tape his TV show. And I, I look over and I see he's standing there with his head down. And like, and I walk over and I, I, I said, hey, we won. Did you hear? We won. And, uh, and he looks at me and goes, oh, no, it's not that. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, I just, when he got off the plane, somebody had informed him that on Friday night, the night before, some of the players who were left behind got in some trouble in downtown Athens, and now he was going to have to deal with that. And he knew that this was going to involve having to suspend some kids or at least, you know, penalize them with playing time or whatever. And so he dropped his, and I think he was just more disappointed in the kids and that he hadn't been able to get through to them that, you know, proper behavior, and particularly when they're not with a team, but they are representing Georgia football. And so Steve Rushton pulls the car up. And so I don't say another word. Mark gets in the back seat. I'm in the front seat with Steve. And I don't say a word. I, I, I just, because I don't know what he wants said in front of Steve or anybody else. So I don't say a word. And so suddenly from the back seat, I hear, you know, I think maybe I'm just in the wrong profession. Maybe I'm just, I shouldn't be doing this. And with that, I turned around. I said, wait a minute. I said, you know what? I said, I, look, I don't know who the kids are that got in trouble. I don't know what they did. And I don't want to know. But let me tell you this. Here's what I do know. You'll go back to Athens. You'll deal with it. And these kids will learn from it and benefit from it and be better down the road because of it. And you know how I know that? Because I know what you did in college because I had <laughs> it wasn't fun to cover. And you know what? I said, you'll, you'll tell Steve what you did. No, 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 no. Don't tell, I said, tell Steve what you did when you were in college. He's not, I don't want to get into that. I said, well, listen, I said, you know, just because they make a mistake doesn't mean that they won't benefit down the road from discipline because you certainly did. And, and you know, that's the kind of guy he is now. You know, that's that's he's a different person now, but he was worried that he hadn't been able to get through to these kids, that they understood, you know, that there's a certain uh, behavioral expectation expected of these players. Great. Absolutely. You know, Chuck, you've been around Georgia forever now, you know, right? I mean, uh, you went there, like you said, and, uh, you know, you followed the program intensive, uh, extensively and intensively uh, for many, many years, but I'm curious, man, just from the thousand foot view, the Kirby Smart era, in your opinion, man, um, just what, what it's been like to witness it, given all you've seen from Georgia over the years, all the struggles they've faced, um, you know, as somebody who loves the university to see where he's taken it. Um, what's that been like for you? Well, l let me start with day one. Kirby, when Kirby takes the job and, uh, and he comes to the university, he comes to sign his contract and hold that first news conference. Uh, but I was asked to do an, an interview with him beforehand, before all of this, when he first arrived on campus, that was to air later on georgiadogs.com uh, for the university's athletic department. And I'm sitting in the, uh, in the in one of those team meeting rooms, and he comes walking in. He looks up, sees me, and says, Chuck, you still here? <laughs> <laughs> which, which made me feel really good. Uh, and I said, well, I've been waiting for you. And um, so... Uh, but that first day, and, and, and you guys will remember this, uh, he said from the get-go, and everything he said has been true. He said, we are going to get bigger on the offensive and defensive lines, and you guys remember that clearly. I that, do. Was, that, was big. that was important to him, and that was big to him. Secondly, every, and this, he said this, everything that touches football, I will be in charge of. If it touches football, I am going to control it. And he has lived up to that. He oversees everything. People would ask me all the time. Uh, they say, oh, well, you spend a lot of time with Kirby. What's he like? I said, yeah, I do spend a lot of time with him. And I said, every single time, I said that he walks in to talk to me about interview, doing radio, TV, whatever it was. I said, uh, the first question is always his. 
And it's always the same question. He looks at me and says, Chuck, how long is this going to take? <laughs> because the, the reason is because he's got kids on the phone that he wants to be texting with or talking to. I've never seen a human being that cares more about recruiting than Kirby does. I, I mean, he is, he is, uh, People ask me all the time, do you think he'll ever go to the NFL? I said, he absolutely will. As soon as the NFL legalizes recruiting, he'll be right there. <laughs> I said, until they re legalize recruiting, I said, you got to understand, he is not your average coach. This guy, all he wants to do is sell. He wants to sell to these kids. And a lot of times, I'm not even sure that they're kids that he wants, but he just wants to hear them say, yes, I want to come. He loves selling the University of Georgia. He loves recruiting, and he spends all of his time doing that. And, and if you want to know what he respects in other coaches, it's not how good they are at Xing and Oing, because he thinks they all can kind of X and O. What he cares, what the guys that he respects and cares about as, as other coaches are guys that love to recruit. That's what he likes. And uh, I, I was getting ready to do a radio uh, post game with him one time. And he walked in and he was, he just clearly, we had won. And he, he this was at, in, in Athens and he was not himself. And I said, you okay? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay. And so I'm sitting there, but he's still, he's just on edge. And I finally pulled the headset off and I said, if you want us to wait, you need to, I said, if there's something you, you know, and I said, what's the matter? And he looks at me and he goes, I got a dozen kids in that other room. He was talking about, he pointed toward the recruiting uh, lounge. He says, I got a dozen kids in that other room. He says, I don't have room for any of them. And I want them all. <laughs> and I thought, Boy, that's, that's Kirby Smart in a nutshell. He wanted every single kid. He wants them all. He wants them all. So, hey, I need to ask you this, Chuck. So, you've how long have you 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 st you came off of the Georgia sideline reporter job? How long ago now? How long has Shock been in there? Well, how many rings does he have? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Sorry. Yeah, that, there you go. You defused the bomb right there. I was going to say, did did, did <laughs> is Shockley the key to Georgia's success? Yeah. That's what's going on here. That I think Mike White wants me to leave basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it, actually three years. I've been off of it for three years. Okay. So is there a, is there kind of a, uh, you know, I was going to mess with you there about the, about the Shockley thing, but is there kind of a silver lining in the, in the fact that you've got a chance to view that from a different space? Like, you know, you, you were working back in those days and you had, you know, you were trying to figure out what was next and you had stuff on your mind. Do you think it maybe been a little was a little bit more enjoyable for you to really sit back and enjoy and 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 soak up those national championships? No, no doubt. There's no doubt. When you're uh, one of the things is look, I, no doubt you see this hair and you saw the hair earlier. I, <laughs> you know, Father Time. You, you know, I don't know where I am on the back nine. I don't know if I'm teeing off on eleven or putting out on eighteen. <laughs> I know I know I'm on that back nine, and it it does start to you know you those are long days long, long days when you're doing football, they're all day, they consume you. And, uh, and, and it was just getting time. And, and the truth of the matter is uh, I've been thrilled. DJ was my personal pick for who I wanted on that sideline. Uh, you know, I talked to Alan Thomas at length about it and, uh, and, and DJ is, I think it's worked out great. And, he, and I love the guy and he's done a terrific job. Uh, and I wouldn't trade anything for the time that I had there, but it certainly did give me that very uh, you know, op that big opportunity to step back and enjoy Georgia football on television and in person and, and watch them win and watch them, you know, I I'd get nervous like fans would. And, you know, the national championship and that Ohio State field goal that <laughs> dead left, you know, all of those things that were, you were thinking, oh man, this was going to work out. And then lo and behold, it worked out and, and Georgia won back to back national, uh, national titles. So, yeah, those those were were uh, were great days for me to be able to enjoy that. Chuck, you've uh, been a part of a lot of cool stuff, like you said, uh, Coach Shula's show, uh, working with the University of Miami, covering those guys, Georgia, 
um, you know, the 96 Olympics. Uh, I mean, all of this stuff, man. For you looking back over your career um, to this point, because it's still going, what, uh, what's what been like that? Is there a highlight? I mean, is there one thing that you look back and you say, wow, that was pretty special to have been? There are several, you know, yeah. uh, the Braves winning the, the World Series, uh, you know, in 95 when I, <clears throat> excuse me, when Tom Glavin, uh, pitched that game against Cleveland, and uh, David Justice hit the solo home run, uh, and we won that, won the World Series. It was the first World Series uh, championship to come to Atlanta, and you know that was that was, you know, a great feeling. Uh, I traveled with Evander Holyfield throughout his career. Uh, I was there uh, for the famous ear bite, but even prior to that, I was there when he knocked out uh, Tyson in the eleventh. Uh, in the 11th uh, round and uh, spent a lot of time with him. Those were, there's nothing like a heavyweight championship fight, or at least at that particular point in time, you know, boxing's kind of faded into the background now, but um, uh, there were all of those things. There was uh, trips to Super Bowls with the Dolphins, uh, with Coach Shula, uh, who uh, to me is one of the greatest men I've ever known. And uh, I, I will tell you just a, a, a great story uh, that I am, I'm really kind of proud of myself about uh, is a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I, one morning I wake up in January and I'm looking through Facebook and I see it's coach Shula's 90th birthday. And I went, Oh my gosh. And I hadn't seen him in several years. And I thought he's 90 years old. I need to see him. If I don't see him, I'm going to wake up one morning and regret it for the rest of my life. So I pick up the phone and I call David, his son, David, who was a, a, is still a receivers coach for Dartmouth, his alma mater. And, um, and I, I said, David, I said, I, I want to see your dad. And uh, he said, Chuck, he would love that. He said, and he gives me this lady's name. So this is his secretary, call her and, and tell her you want to come see dad. And so I called her. She said, uh, I'll get back to you. She called me back just a few minutes later. Uh, she said, Mr. Dowdle, she said, uh, Coach Shula and Marianne would love it if you could uh, come have lunch at the house. And uh, I said, tell me when I'll be there. So we set the next uh, Monday as a date. And um, it was in February of, uh, I forgot, it was just a couple of years ago. And I, I flew down and my daughter who lived in Boca picked me up and we go to Coach Shula's home and uh, we have lunch there, just the four of us, uh, Marianne and coach and me and Don and, 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 uh, my daughter. And we, we had, uh, fabulous. They had lunch brought in. It was, it was just a, a wonderful time. And I got a chance to, to tell him, you know, how much I loved him and appreciated all he'd done for me and the time that we'd worked together. And, and, uh, and when we finished, um, uh, having lunch, uh, I said, I said, what do you get? And he was in a wheelchair. And I said, what do you get to do? I said, you get out. Do you get? He goes, yeah. He says, I go out. He says, I, I ride around in a golf cart, ride around the golf course. And they live on a golf course there and, uh, at Indian Creek. And I said, uh, he said, I don't play. I said, well, I know that. But he says, but I go out there and ride around some. And he, and he says, you know, he says, so I do get out some. And Marianne, his wife, looks up and says, and he goes to the horse track. I said, whoa, <laughs> I said, because I've never known him to do this. This is a man who every day of his life, as long as I knew him, every day of his life, he got up and the first thing he did every morning was go to mass. And I had asked him one time, what were you going to do if you weren't a football coach? And he said, I wanted to be a priest. And I mean, so he was, his Catholic religion was very important to him. And uh, I said, you go to the horse track? And uh, he, he kind of, Shies again, and uh, she, Marianne says, "Tell him, tell Chuck who uh, takes you." And I said, "Who takes you?" And he kind of looked at me, kind of sheepish. And now, you have to understand, it's a ninety-year-old man, and it, and and all that he'd been through. And he looks at me, he says, "Greasy." I said, "Bob Greasy." <laughs> he goes, "Yeah." And Bob Greasy would would come and pick Don up, like a couple, according to Marianne, a couple of times a month take him to Gulfstream racetrack. They'd have lunch. They'd sit there and bet on the horses and just have a nice day at the racetrack. Now think about that. A Super Bowl winning quarterback going and taking his 90 year old coach to the racetrack just to get him out of the house and spend some time with him all those decades later. I mean, what a great story.
Yeah. But Greasy, that's what Bob Greasy would do. And um, and so I, I left uh, I left Coach Shula that day. But like I said, I got a chance to hug his neck and tell him how much I loved him and appreciated him. And uh, two months later, he was gone. Uh, you know, and so uh, I, I'm so glad that I did what I did. Sure. And appreciated that time with him. Man, I bet that that's that's incredible. That's that's one of the greatest stories I think Greasy. I've ever heard. Just in yeah. Bob Greasy's taking Don Shula to the horse track. That's yeah. So hey, I want to jump back to your time down in Miami because uh you're a big fan of an establishment down there that both me and Roos are a big fan of, and that's uh Joe Stonecrab. And oh, yeah. uh, I've had some conversations with you about it, and I heard I, I've heard that you were a, you were a regular down there back in the day. You had some hookups down at the Joe Stone Crab, the famous Joanne. Joanne yeah. owns it. She, yeah, she owns it, and uh, uh, you know, for years there, there'd be like a two hour wait, you know, to get in there. And uh, and the Mater D though, if I was there, you know, Mater D just you know would call me in and 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 uh, my party, you know, we we'd sit down and. Uh, and, you know, people look like, you know, what in the world? Why is this guy go, going in ahead of everybody? And um, and so one day I was sitting there with Joanne. And Joanne Bass was her name. And her grandfather was uh, Joe, who owned, who started Joe Stonecraft. And uh, and Joanne, uh, we were sitting there talking and said, do people ever complain about you just letting me come in? And she goes, oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> I said, I said, well, what do you say to them? She says, I tell them it's my restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I, I'm, I was I was hoping I could goad you into telling me the story you told me once about you, the time you brought your folks down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I just started. Okay. Oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> oh, I love this story. This is one of the greatest. Okay. I'm, my parents come down from Atlanta and I'm on TV in Miami now and had been on TV for probably a couple of months. And so uh, this was back in the day when there was no ESPN and, you know, you had to get all your sports off the local channels. And uh, so I take my parents to Joe Stone Crabs and we go to, and they thought it was pretty cool first that we just got called right in, you know, ahead of everybody and got our table. And, and there's a table sitting on the other side and there are these people that keep turning around and staring and turning around and staring. And, and I'm, you know, I tell my parents, oh God, this is so embarrassing. I go, well, you know, I said, you know, it's embarrassing that they're looking at me, but you know, they see me on TV and they're they're staring at me because they notice these people just kept turning around staring. And so we're continuing having dinner. So I have to excuse myself and I start to get up and I slide my chair back and turn around and seated right behind me is the speaker of the house, Tip O'Neill. <laughs> The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tip O'Neill, is seated, seated right behind me. Those people had no clue who I was. They probably wish I'd move out of the way so they could see the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, sitting back there. It was, yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. Did, did you tell your parents any differently, or did you just uh, let well, them keep on believing yeah, they were looking well, at you? I did later. I did later, <laughs> but I, I did later. So. So yeah, that was uh, that was rather embarrassing. But let me tell you, I've been around some other people who've had. I, I don't know if I've told either one of you this story, but I've got to tell you this one. And this is over somebody that you know real well. This is an Aaron Murray story. Okay, we're going to play South Carolina that night game when both teams, I think, were ranked in the top five. You remember the trip to Columbia? Okay, we go over there. I'm going out for the coin flip. Aaron is our captain. He's yeah. our team captain. We go out there for the coin flip. And I've forgotten the official's name, but he, you know, get, captain shake hands. He shows them the coin, you know, heads, tails, and, and he flips it. He, he looks at Aaron and says, you know, you get the call because you're the visitors. And uh, so he flips the coin. Aaron calls it and calls it correctly. And he says, captain, you've won the toss. What do you want? And Aaron looks at him kind of wide-eyed, looks at him and says, uh, we want a kick going that way. And the referee looks at him, he goes, you only get one. And, and <laughs> at, this point, at this point, I look over and all of us, everybody there, Aaron just glazes over. It is obvious that if we are now waiting for Aaron to speak again, we are going to be there a long time. <laughs> And so the referee realizing now that Aaron is totally 
Walls <laughs> looks at him and bails him out and says, Captain, do you want to defer? And Aaron goes, yeah, 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 we'll defer. And so now, having heard Aaron make a total debacle of this entire coin flip, he looks at Connor Shaw and he says, Captain, I assume you want the football. <laughs> and Connor goes, yeah, yeah, we want the football. <laughs> and with that, with that, we the coin flip ends and we we kick off to uh to South Carolina. But it was so Aaron goes, Yeah, we want to kick going that way. <laughs> so, oh no, no, that's not how this works. You want to get one. And then Aaron did not know what to say next. He did not know it was it was hysterical. Well, and, yeah, I can imagine. It, it, I, I often think it was awfully kind of that official to bail him out and say, Captain, do you want to defer? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what we want. Just a, just a great one. Well, Chuck, we finish everybody up. We're going to let you go uh, as bad as we don't want listen, to. I, um, listen, you got to promise us that you'll come back, Chuck. Absolutely. I, I, I would love every minute of it. Uh, yeah, awesome. we, we, awesome. we can't wait. Listen, I owe, you two, I owe <laughs> both of you guys so much. Anytime I'm available for y'all. I mean, we, we may put you on the list for co-host after this. We'll start doing it without each other. We'll, we'll, what we'll do is Listen, we'll start pretending we like we're – We didn't even get into some of the some of the Braves and Holyfield stories. That's what I'm saying, man. We, yeah. we, got, we, we, we got a whole nother, we got a whole nother thing coming. I mean yeah, – we got, we got, oh, Can I tell you my favorite story? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> of course. This is Mike Fratello and Dominique Wilkins. Okay? All right. Dominique, nicest superstar ever. Ever. And uh, – so the way that you used to work for, for Hawks games, and I sat right behind the bench uh, of the Hawks bench, would uh, during timeouts, the team would come over to the bench and the guys that were on the court that were playing, they would all sit down and the other guys would stand up and circle around and Fratello would kneel down in front of them and draw up whatever, you know, looking up at the guys. And so this particular game, uh, Dominique had been going down the floor and he threw a behind the back pass and it went out of bounds. And of course, Fratello was shit, you know, you know, so he's cussing up, but the game continued and he'd kind of forgotten it. And suddenly there's a timeout and, uh, and the guys come over and they're all sitting there and he's going over everything. And now the, the 10 second whistle blows. And so the guys get up and start to drift back up out onto the court uh, to resume play. And Fratello's got his clipboard. He turns around to lay his clipboard on the edge of the scores table. And it's like a light bulb went off in his head. And he spins around and he's yell, he yells, Nick, Nick, like that. And Dominique looks back at him like, yeah. And he says, Fratello at the top of his lungs screams, next time you get that ball around behind your back, just shove it up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and Dominique's eyes were like this big. We're like this big. But, but he stayed the team and kept playing, you know. Bruce, well, I can was, already tell you, one of, one of these days I'm going to set up one of these things and we'll say, hey, Chuck, we're going to have you co-host, and I'm just going to get on here. I'm not going to record it or anything. I'm just going to ask him <laughs> questions, get him to tell me stories. Absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and just talk with <laughs> Chuck. because we, 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 got, we got a lot more, so we, we can get into particularly some of those that go back to Braves, Absolutely. Cox, and Leo, and some of those. We got some good ones. <laughs> I'm already excited about them. Yeah. So we finish off everybody. Uh, you know, We let everybody go with the same two questions. Uh, I have one. Bruce has one. And mine is, all right, you know, life's over. You're done. You've passed away, and you're you're you get a chance to send your own self out exactly how you want to go. Who's eulogizing Chuck Dowdle? Dead or alive? Uh, Eric Hager. Uh, he Eric was my work wife. He he uh, he was my photographer at WSB, and then on with University of Georgia. We were together for 30 years. We're still together all the time. Only now it's on the golf course and and uh, and traveling around, seeing each other. But uh, yeah, we were we were we were like this. We were uh, uh, people didn't see Eric without seeing me, or see me without seeing Eric. We were just together all the time, uh, all over the country. We traveled and and uh, we would always take our golf clubs and wherever we were going, we'd play golf and cover whatever we had to cover. But uh, Eric would be the one, and I'd have to make sure that he was censored ahead of time. But, uh, yeah, it'd be Eric Hager. <laughs> well, Chuck, uh, you've, you mentioned travel, and my question uh, right, rolls right into that. What is the worst hotel room that Chuck Dowdle has ever stayed in? 
Oh, that's easy. It, this is so easy. Well, uh, we were, uh, Eric, me, Eric, my producer, Kevin Gurky, we were covering the uh, Major League All Star game the year it was at Fenway Park. And uh, we were staying, most of you know, I've got a home up in Maine. And so we decided to stay at my home because it was only about a 90 minute drive down to the to Fenway. And we were going to stay there. But then the night of the game, we were going to have to stay uh, in Boston. And so uh, we tried to get hotel reservations and boy, they were tight. And it finally ended up that um, this one hotel, one of the nicer hotels in downtown Boston, I uh, had a couple of rooms that Kevin and Eric got and they said, well, they've got a because Kevin was in charge of them. And he said, they've got a third room, but it, it, they've just been able to convert. They had converted like a broom closet into a hotel. <laughs> there was enough room to have a bed and the bathroom. You couldn't, you had to brush your teeth standing up. You couldn't bend over because there was not enough room to, it was the smallest room. And I, I made them both go in it and like, look, they could only go in one at a time, but it was by far the worst hotel room I've ever been in. But I only had to stay there one night and I only had to sleep there. But nobody it, ever, it nobody was, forgets. I nobody forget, forgets the worst room. I touch both walls. <laughs> Well, hey, you're a big guy. You're you're a tall guy, so you know, there's there, some there's some length there. Um, well, Chuck, listen, man. Um, I'll say this: uh, two things. One, you know, you, you're kind of like the Masters Golf Tournament. This interview has been because people build it up, and you're like, there's no way it'll ever meet expectations, and it, and it finds a way to exceed them. So you found a way to to make this better than even Roos and I thought it was going to be. And uh, number two, you said you didn't know if you were teeing off on 11 or 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 putting on 18. Dude, whatever you're doing, it, the putt's going in and the drive's in the middle of the fairway, buddy. I appreciate it. You know that. Hey, you listen, and like, like, like you said, man, you took the time to uh, sit down with Coach Shula and tell him what he meant to you. I just want to tell you, man, uh, it's been an honor to have you on here. It's been an honor to work alongside of you, talk to you on the radio, man. Like I said, growing up, it, one of my childhood heroes, so it's really cool, man. Jake, I appreciate that, both of you. And I trust me when I tell you this, too, I, I thoroughly envy both of your knowledge of college football and, uh, and, the, and the way you guys conduct your business. Because it's like I asked somebody, you know, well, where did you hear that? Well, Jake Roos put it up or Jake Rowe put it up. I said, well, you go to the bank with it. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. We appreciate you so man. much. Buddy. All right. Yeah. You guys have a great day. All right. You too. Go dogs. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, they say they say never meet your heroes, uh, but I'm sure you're glad. Like, Chuck would be mine if I grew up anywhere in that market. My, yeah. Mine was Ducky Wall on WALB down in uh, South Georgia, down in Albany. But uh, oh, man, that that was listen. I got chills like a couple of times during that yeah. thing, man. Like he, that was one of the, some of the greatest storytelling. Period. Could have been a this show or otherwise. Could have easily been a three hour show. Like oh, I, I mean, if if I'd had my druthers. We would have taken all of Chuck's time, but uh, he's got to get ready for the we'd NIT. Have on, we'd have Chuck on once a month if it was up. Yeah, <laughs> once yeah. a week. <laughs> we'd do a second <laughs> show and just be the Chuck show. Yeah, abandon the format we currently have and yeah. just have a show with Chuck Dowdle. Park like after it. dark with Chuck Dowdle <laughs> once a week. And then, you know, then we'd fit it. We'd do whatever we could do otherwise. But, uh, man, I really appreciate him coming on, and that yeah. was amazing. Um, and just, man, I, I got to say this about Chuck, too, man. Like, you know, in getting to meet him, have him on the show, like, he just makes you feel good, man. Like he's, I've he you've never, you've never, I've never heard him say a cross word to anybody. He's always no. smiling and laughing, man. He's, he's just a guy who's really enjoying life. And, and uh, it's cool to be around him and cool to talk to him. Yeah. You, you know, a man is, is made from some great cloth whenever he can't find it, when he's never said anything bad about me, you know, I mean, <laughs> sure. and, or you, like he's never, he's never talked trash about you to me. So yeah, um, we, yeah. we didn't I wonder if talk he, about Palmer though. So he does. He talks about Palmer in <laughs> yeah. bags on Palmer. The only man I hate is Palmer Toms. He said, yeah. once. <laughs> By the way, Chuck Dotto met Palmer right before the show. So um, he Palmer's, right. Palmer's producing for us and always, as always, doing a great job. I wonder if we could have gotten Chuck to come on if he knew that there was a segment right after him. <laughs> Probably not. Um, he's a bit more of a professional than anybody here is. So, uh, yeah. Well, I've got I got a question go queued up for you, buddy. Oh, good, good, good. I'm glad. Go ahead. All right. So I was thinking about this. Um, we love to eat. Both of us do. Yep. Um I got to thinking about it. Um, it's one of those, would you like this or this? 
Would you prefer being lactose intolerant or having to be gluten free? Oh, uh, it's it's lactose for me. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, because beer has gluten in it. Um, <laughs> and I love. <laughs> oh man, I love. A, I mean, I love a cold beer. Um, you know, listen. Now, I'm not saying that I would have an easy time giving up cheese, especially cheese would be the the really hard thing because it's in everything. Yeah, it makes almost everything better. I don't drink milk. Um, that's I almost never in my life do I ever have milk. Uh, I don't eat cereals. So Even our fair life proteins, I guess, don't have milk, don't have lactose. They do, they do. They have milk, but they don't have lactose. Oh, that's right. You're right. Filtered. You're right. Yeah, it's yeah. like triple filtered. Yeah, yeah, so I guess they don't have um, it. I do eat some yogurt, I guess, once in a while. And once in a while, I'll get a sweet tooth for a, an ice cream bar or something like that. But I think I would have a much easier time. I, I love bread. Um, I love, um, you know, like a, a fried batter. Um, you know, you, if you had to be gluten free, like you can't, you can't do that stuff. And I'm assuming we're talking celiac and not like, you know, like I get sick if I do it. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I, I, I'm not really well versed on. So I've like, heard, so I've heard some people say celiac is really the only gluten intolerance deal out there. And other people are like, there are other, you know, deals, but yeah, I think that there's a spectrum on that whole thing. Um, but the celiac stuff, man, is it's really gnarly. Um, like the people who have that stuff, it, uh, my, my grandmother's, uh, husband has it. And, um, it's like, I mean, it damn near kill you when you, uh, when you eat some, some gluten. So it, it seems like more gnarly to me. Like I said, I love, a uh, you know, some fried chicken in my, uh, in my, uh, rice bowl or something like that. Gluten's a lot harder, I think, to avoid too, cause it's in everything. Um, you know, it's hidden and stuff. You gotta, if you're buying something in a box at a store, it's going to have gluten in it. Right. So yeah, pretty much. That's a good I point. Think, I think that, uh, I think I would have to, uh, I'd have to go lactose. Uh, both of them would be very, very hard. Um, but gluten, I would, I would definitely miss it more. Thank the good Lord every day that I don't deal with either one of them. <laughs> well, which one would you fall on? I would probably give up gluten. I, ever since, I mean, look, you can look at me. I mean, I, I look like the kind of guy that's going to say what I'm about to say, but I have, I am the, I am such a big fan of cheese. Like <laughs> I love cheese so much. It's probably going to be the reason I die at like 53. Um, but I mean, I grew up, man, I had a, I, I stayed with my great grandmother in the summers and we fished with a cane pole, picked blackberries. She lived in the garden of Eden with all these different fruit trees and stuff. And we'd pick fresh fruit. And eat cheese in the afternoon. Oh. And uh, what kind of just, cheese are we talking here? Um, nothing special, brother. We're talking about like a little hunk of craft medium cheddar. Yeah, you know, yeah. No, like no, that. that's 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 that is a special cheese, man. And every now and then, every now and then, she'd run up to what she called the commodities, and uh, we'd get a we'd get a thing of basic like I don't even know if that has lactose in it, brother. I mean, it might be plastic, <laughs> yeah, but we would sure. eat it. We'd tear it up. I know that, but uh every morning she'd make cheese toast for me for breakfast um i've just i love cheese oh, cheese toast is a good one man that's a that's a that's a combination of what we're talking about here too i've really been into string cheese lately um uh, I've, I've never I, i've never that's one cheese i don't do uh, man i don't got I a do weird this, taste to it I, I, I it does i would i would agree with that but it's um it's pretty it's got a decent amount of protein for the calories in it yeah. And, uh, and it feels like it lasts a while, you know, cause you get to sit there and peel it. And so yeah. I'm not, know. I'm not crazy about that. And I'm not crazy about like fresh mozzarella by itself either. Oh, like, come on. I mean, it's great when it's melted and you got some tomato stuff, you know, like some, but like, you know, like people just eating like the little mozzarella balls by themselves. Like Absolutely. I've got to have a little bit of balsamic or a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, and that's one of the only few things I'll eat with balsamic, but a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of marinara or something to get it going with. Okay. Okay. So my question for you today is, um, I, I went on the, the least, uh, favorites, um, last week, uh, we talked about your least favorite household chore. And so I want to kind of stick in that vein. Um, and so one of the, the one today is, uh, it's not least favorite, I guess, but who is a, uh, really popular music artist that you feel is quite overrated? Led Zeppelin. Wow, that yeah. is a hot take, Jake. Rowe. I know, I know. <laughs> I had to be honest. I'll, oh, okay, I'll go two. I'll go two. Led Zeppelin and Leonard Skinner. Okay, uh, can you explain? Well, first of all, I um, I hope that when I die, 
that the that Sweet Home Alabama will not be played within a thousand miles of me. <laughs> sure, okay. Um, that's one thing. It's, both of them have things that I like, but I do not understand the obsession. And I've got another big one too that I think is very overrated: the Beatles. Um, uh, you you know how I feel about that one. Yeah, I'm yeah, kinda, I do. I'm, I'm I'm on board with that one. I, yeah. I'm, they just don't do it for me. I'm not saying they're not important. It's just yeah. not. I, just oh, don't care to I, I think all of these bands are important. Like sure. I think all of them, you know, and I understand, like I understand the appeal to some people, but I just like, I can't do it, man. Like if you told me to sit and listen to Zeppelin all day, I'd be like, I'm not doing it. I'm just not, I'm not doing it. I could listen to Pink Floyd all day. I could listen to Cream all day or, or, you know, if you I kind thought of, you were about I mean, to say Creed. No, I mean, <laughs> there was a time. Yeah, sure. Everybody had human clay spinning in the youth group, buddy. Yes, sir, buddy. When I had uh, back in the day, when I had my my puka shell necklace and the and the, and, the, and, the, and I had my own CD player and my own truck, you know, higher and and my own prison were just flying, wow. dude. My, my own my, prison is still a banger, dude. Yeah, it, it, my own prison. The the the. Uh, w- <laughs> I don't know why I just I just I just went back to the Scott Stapp commercial, um, the Marlins commercial. Oh God! Let's yeah. play ball. <laughs> That's the a guy hitting you right on the screws. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I mean yeah, if you, if you haven't video, seen if anybody it, watching this has never seen Scott Stapp's Marlins song, and I feel like Palmer, we may be introducing Palmer to this. Um, you've got to go listen to it. Jim Rome's bit on it. Is Jim, Ro- go listen to Jim Rome's bit on it. Don't don't listen to the song by itself. No, yeah, Just go straight yeah. in. <laughs> this is this is up there with Stone Cold ET. Bro. Am I wrong or is that sounding better? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. So that uh, I did this on I did this on the Georgia show. I can't even remember what I said it about. I just remember saying I got some homework for you. So homework for Park After Dark listeners: Stone Cold ET. Yeah. Um, Jim Rome's bit on that on uh, on Scott Stapp's uh, Marlins commercial. Yeah. And uh, go and look up Clem Fandango uh, on uh, I enjoyed for Toast Clem of London. Yeah. On uh, on YouTube and yeah. uh, oh my, hey Stephen, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can hear you, Clem Fandango. <laughs> yeah. Enlighten Wait, me, so, Plato. Hold on, we've we've gotten off track here, though. I want to know what. So, what's what's your what's your beef with with Zeppelin? I mean, like, do you, it's just there, not. It's not. It's not like for me. It's not. It's not consumable in in any sort of. Uh, I mean, everybody's got their. So, my thing with great music is, is can I sit there? Can I uh, can I mow the yard? Right? Can I mow the yard or do something else for a couple of hours and not turn you off? Right, and not be done with you. Like, I think the Avit brothers do some have some really good stuff. I have a hard time listening to them on loop sure. because there's there's a little bit of a grating sound there that's you know it's kind of a harsh sound. It's it's a good sound, and you know they're you know like Immigrant Son and all that stuff like from from Led Zeppelin. I love it. Like I love the classics and they're good, but it just it it wears on me after a while. Like it it really does. And and. Well, and you know, I- I feel like too those those songs have been they have been played to death, right? I mean, you've heard you've heard them a million. If I never heard Stairway again, I'd probably be okay. Yeah, and that's one of my. And the funny thing is, is is everybody you're talking about, like with the Beatles, Hey Jude, like sure. kill me, yeah, okay, <laughs> like kill me, hold sure. my head underwater until it stops bubbling, okay, <laughs> um, uh. Sweet Home Alabama, done. Yeah, like, you know, here's, here's some good. Now I will say this: as I heard Colin Cowherd say one time, "Here's an ice pick. There's my retina. Go to work." <laughs> you know, Skinner. Skinner. I will say this: uh, there are some really good Skinner deep cuts. Um, they okay. they have a they have some good stuff out there. I Sweet Home Alabama, I'm with you. Uh, Mr. Saturday Night Special, I don't really care for anymore. I'm okay. Uh, I'm okay with that one just because I I think it's really well written. But uh, but like um, all I can do is is write about it is is a tremendous song. That's such a good song, man. Uh, give me back. Dude, my I even used to be a song. big fan of Tuesday's Gone, and I I have a hard time with it now a little bit because it gets overplayed. It um, the Breeze is probably one of my favorites from them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would probably you know, number one would be Zeppelin, and then two would be Skinner, and 
well, no, number two would be the Beatles. Like, okay. honestly, it's the Beatles. It's not just like, man, I know I'm going to catch some hell for this. The Beatles, it's not that it's a grating sound as much as I just don't think any of it's very good. Like, I just don't think. It just, it's never done anything for me. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, I like, you know, it's good pop music. And I, and like I said, I get why people dig it. But like, for me, it's never hit me in the way that it, like. Ooh, I just thought of another one, by the way. Okay. I'm going to channel my inner dude here and I'm going to say, fuck the Eagles, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Hotel I California think, may be worse than any of them. That's a tough one. That's a tough yeah. one. I've heard that song a million times for sure. Hotel, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, take it easy. Um, and and um, Travis Tritt did it better. I, 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 I believe so. <laughs> I was wondering whether I even wanted to go there, but yes, I, I like Travis Tritt's rendition better. Yeah, absolutely. I I I have a easier time believing that Travis Tritt has seven women, you know, on his mind. Hey, dude, at, at that time, that is not out of the question in my opinion. Take we his fine ass down to Daytona. Can somebody get Can somebody get Travis Tritt hooked up with Bark After Dark? I yeah, we need Travis Tritt, Tritt on Bark After Dark. That's I mean, you want to talk about another childhood hero, Travis. Tritt. <laughs> <laughs> if we came to do get T R O U B L E live Ooh, or uh, or um. What was that song? Uh, oh, uh, here's a quarter. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Or, I mean, the Marty Stewart uh, duets, man. Oh. You know, I, I heard a funny story. Uh, not a funny story, but I heard a story on Here's a Quarter one time um, that don't know if I'll ever have a chance to tell it on Bark After Dark, so I want to tell it. But I was listening to the radio one time, and I can't remember. I guess it was the it was that they used to do the top 40 countdown or top whatever countdown. Crook and Chase. Yeah, Crook and Chase. That's what yeah, it was. Yeah. Crook and Chase. And we were pulling butter beans up in the in in uh one summer and you know if you've never d done butter beans you pull up the whole plant you just throw them in the back of the truck and then you take them back in the house and you sit there and you pick all the butter beans off before you shell them um you know because they don't re they don't really make again um like like peas and stuff like that do um so we were doing that and i just, i'll never forget i was sitting there hot as all get out you know ants all over my feet and everything like that and they told the story about the guy who wrote Here's a Quarter. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just wrong, wrong song. It's I'm going to be somebody. Okay. And they were like, uh, he was writing the song and it was in the rough stages. And he goes into a convenience store and he grabs like a drink and a pack of peanuts and he's out there paying for it. And he's singing the song under his breath. And the lady behind the counter goes, me too, honey. Me too. And he was like, he said the song was kind of on the cutting room floor at that time. They didn't know if they were going to, you know, if he was going to keep writing. And he goes, I've got to finish this song because yeah. this is something that everybody, you know, kind of, you know, can identify with. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was a pretty cool story. It's, for some reason, that song, that story has stuck with me 30 years probably. That's a great, that's a great song too. It is. It's a that's phenomenal a, song. Yeah. But uh, also, yeah. My brain is broken because I came up with Crook and Chase like that, man. <laughs> like, like, I, I, wish, I wish that I could come up with anything important in my life as quickly as I came up with. Oh, yeah. Top 40 countdown country music mid 90s. Yeah. Crook and Chase. Yeah. The, uh, I, it makes me think about it makes me think about the fact how many dudes how many dudes had a song that was on the Crook and Chase countdown that are making keys at Ace Hardware. <laughs> sure. hundred percent, man. <laughs> They're, they're selling big green eggs and chopping keys for everybody. <laughs> Leroy Parnell. Shout out Leroy. Yeah. You're awesome. We love you guys. I mean, yeah. I listen to your music all day, every day. All right, folks, this has been awesome. We appreciate it. We're going to be back with you next Tuesday night. I'm going to the masters on Monday. Thank goodness. Um, and yeah, uh, we won't be able to make yeah, it back. Money. And then we don't have any spring practice availability next week. And so we'll be doing the Georgia show in the morning. And we're going to do Bark After Dark in the afternoon. So we'll be back with you on Tuesday night next week. And it's going to be a Jake and Jake show. Um, we've got some stuff planned that we're going to get to. But for this episode of Bark After Dark, maybe the greatest ever, nothing to do with us. I'm not shocked. Right. We appreciate you. Woof, woof.